Thank you. And that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In recent weeks, we've been reminded again how stretched hospitals are right across the UK as they seek to cope with demand. And once again, we thank doctors and nurses for all that they do. Can the First Minister confirm today whether the number of hospital beds in Scotland has gone up or down over the last five years? First Minister. Well, as Ruth Davidson, I suspect, is fully aware, in line with uh, the position in all parts of the UK, uh, as the pattern of hospital uh, attendances and the nature of treatment that people get has changed, the number of acute beds uh, has changed in line with that. And not just across the UK, but across the uh, Western world, I think we will see acute beds uh, decline as more care is carried out on a day case basis, or indeed more care delivered in the community. But our responsibility is to make sure we have the right number of beds. And of course, the health secretary and uh, officials monitor that on an ongoing basis. Can I just, uh, in relation to the pressures we've seen in our health service over the winter period so far, and in particular over the, the festive period, uh, again put on record my thanks to those working extremely hard on the front line of our health service. We've seen uh, an unprecedented increase in demand in recent weeks. The health secretary set out some of the figures earlier this week in her statement. Uh, they include a 40% increase in calls to the ambulance service, a doubling of calls to NHS 24, a 10% increase in a &E attendances over the festive fortnight, 20% increase in the week before Christmas. And of course, in addition to increased volumes of attendance at a &E, we're seeing more people uh, present with more severe illness. Uh, much of that increased demand has been down to an increase in flu rates uh, over this winter. It was reported last week that in the seven days up to Hugmanay, uh, flu rates uh, were more than double at uh, the same period last year. I, I can advise the Chamber that figures for the first week in January are about to be published, probably just about now, by Health Protection Scotland, and they show a further doubling uh, of flu rates uh, in Scotland. Uh, last week it was 46 per 100,000. Uh, that has gone up to, 100, uh, to 107 per 100,000, uh, and that is four times the level of flu in this week uh, last year. In spite of all of that, presiding officer, uh, thanks to winter planning, thanks to the efforts of our NHS staff, uh, our NHS is coping admirably. So we continue to see, even at the height of these pressures, uh, almost eight out of 10 people attending A&E being dealt with within four hours. And of course, we have not required to sanction a blanket cancellation uh, of planned uh, operations as has been seen elsewhere in the UK. So I think all of us owe an enormous debt of gratitude to those in the NHS. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister seemed unable to give the figures that I asked for, so the figures are these. Five years ago, five years ago, there were more than 23,000 hospital beds in Scotland, and now there's nearly 2,000 fewer. And we know the government's rationale for this. They say that more care should be delivered outside of hospitals, closer to people's homes, in social care. And it is a laudable aim. But if it is going to work, it needs, there needs to be places available for patients in the community. So the, can the First Minister answer me this? Has the number of social care places for elderly patients in Scotland increased or been cut in the last five years? First Minister. Well, firstly, for example, we have, uh, I think, around 700 more intermediate care beds in our NHS uh, now uh, as part of that process of shifting the balance of care. And in terms of acute beds, just to uh, go back to that particular point, of course, during the winter and in this winter uh, included, we've seen hundreds of additional winter surge uh, beds as part of the planning for increased capacity. Um, in terms of social care, again, as Ruth Davidson is very well aware. This government, while I don't uh, stand here and say that all is perfect, we all have uh, work to do. We all face pressures, particularly during these winter periods. But this government, in many respects, when it comes to social care, is ahead of any other part of the UK. Uh, so we have seen over the past uh, two or, uh, financial years now, uh, significant sums of money transferred from the NHS into social care uh, to support that shift in the balance of care. And of course, earlier this week, we saw uh, the health secretary in England being given responsibility for social care uh, for the first 
time. Uh, as England now uh, presumably is looking to integrate health and social care, something that this government has already done. So yes, there is pressure on services. Our NHS is, uh, again, in common with uh, health services in many different parts of not just the UK but the world, is undergoing a transition as it adapts to the needs of an ageing population. Part of that is transferring uh, care from the acute service into the community. Uh, and this government has already done a lot of work and will continue to do so. Ruth Davison. I often ask the First Minister about health and social care in Scotland, and she often answers me about the situation in England. And I think people in Scotland want to hear about what's happening in Scotland. But if she does want to bring England into the chamber, she should be aware that the number of beds in Scotland are being cut at nearly double the rate than the number of England's in hospital. And the number of elderly social care beds in England has actually gone up over five years. And under her tenure, they've gone down in Scotland. So we have both the number of hospital beds falling in Scotland and the number of social, elderly social care places have fallen too. And the consequence is obvious. It means that hospitals get filled up. It means that thousands of elderly patients can't be discharged because there's nowhere for them to go. And it means that the cost of delayed discharge to the NHS in Scotland is over £100 million per year. If there are fewer hospital beds and there are fewer social care places for the elderly, is it any surprise that we have a problem? First Minister. Actually, delayed, the, the number of beds uh, lost in our uh, health service because of delayed discharge is down. The uh, most recent published figures show that it's down 10% over uh, the, the past year. Uh, we don't have published figures yet for the festive period, but the information we have, because obviously we're monitoring it carefully, is that delayed discharge uh, has further reduced over the festive period. That is, delayed discharges are not the reasons for the pressures, uh, or an increase in delayed discharge is not the reason for the, the pressures we're seeing uh, in our hospitals. Uh, now, uh, Ruth Davidson talks about the comparisons uh, with England. I know the opposition don't like us making those comparisons, although they make those comparisons when it suits them on plenty yeah, exactly. uh, of other exactly. issues. But let me... Let me be clear here. Uh, the benchmark for success uh, for this government are the targets we set uh, ourselves, not what's happening elsewhere in the UK. But when we have opposition parties who come to this chamber and try to make out that somehow the pressures in our National Health Service are uniquely uh, to do with mismanagement of the SNP government, it's perfectly legitimate to compare the performance in Scotland with the performance in the parts of the UK where their parties are in power. And I, I don't know if Ruth Davidson has bothered to look at the news this morning where clinicians in England are saying that they've run out of beds in the NHS. Now, we have a responsibility to make sure that our NHS is performing and that's what we support our frontline clinicians and our health boards to do. But the fact of the matter is that Scotland's NHS, uh, in spite of all of these pressures, and actually the pressures that we've been facing over the past couple of weeks, are actually higher than they are in other parts of the UK. Flu levels are higher. There's more influenza A in Scotland than in other parts of the UK, which affects elderly people disproportionately. So the pressures are higher, but nevertheless, Scotland's NHS remains the best performing NHS Absolutely. anywhere yes. in the United Kingdom. And it is about time, I think, that the opposition recognised the achievements of those working so hard on the front line of our National Health Service. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, opposition leaders come to this chamber to ask the Scottish Government to take responsibility for the Scottish Health Service. And here, here is what doctors and nurses have been saying to us in the last fortnight. They're saying that people are waiting too long in A&E departments because there are no beds for them on wards and because many of those hospital beds are taken up by patients who are waiting for their social care arrangements. But this SNP government has cut both hospital beds and elderly social care places. So when something like a flu crisis hits, the system breaks down. We need a moratorium before the next crisis, so will the First Minister promise to stop cutting hospital beds until patients have somewhere to go? First Minister. Well, 
you know, the hypocrisy of the Tories when it comes to these issues is breathtaking. Uh, not only do they criticise uh, things in terms of the changing pattern of care that are happening in Scotland, that presumably they support when exactly the same things are happening where their party is in power in England. But not only that, we have a situation and just in a few weeks' time, we will again debate the budget for next year. And Ruth Davidson and her colleagues will stand up in this chamber uh, and they will ask us to deliver tax policies that introduce cuts to people at the top end of the income spectrum. Tax policies that if we were to follow would take £500 million out of the money that we have available to invest in our National Health Service. Does Ruth Davidson know what £500 million amounts to in terms of nurses? That is equivalent to 12 thousand nurses that the Tories would remove from our National Health Service. So we will continue to get on with the job of delivering health care for the people of Scotland, supporting our health services. They respond to these unprecedented demands that they're facing right now and thanking and being grateful to those who are working so hard right across our country. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. This week, we have heard apologies from the First Minister to the thousands of people who have experienced unacceptable delays for hospital treatment and who have waited hours in pain for ambulance crews to arrive. Apologies are welcome. But can the First Minister tell us, and can she tell the people of Scotland, what changes she will make to ensure that our NHS in Scotland will not be in the same position this time next year. We will, First Minister. We will, we will continue to take the action that ensures that our National Health Service is the best performing health service anywhere in the UK. I have already outlined uh, the unprecedented pressures our National Health Service is facing. I've given uh, the figures uh, for the first week in January around flu, uh, flu rates that are four times uh, in that week what they were in the same week uh, last year. It is not possible when you face demands like that to completely eliminate the pressure on services. No health service uh, can completely do that. But because of the uh, plans that our health boards have put in place, uh, supported by the £22 million of additional funding provided by the government, and of course, uh, enabled by the hard work of frontline NHS staff, we have a situation situation uh, where uh, the average uh, response time for emergency calls for the ambulance service, despite the 40% increase in demand, is eight minutes. Uh, we have a situation where almost eight out of ten patients are still being dealt with within four hours. And it's important, let me just uh, address this point of the four-hour target. We often, and I am guilty of this myself sometimes, talk about that target being one to see patients. It's not just to see patients Amen. within four hours. It's yeah. to see, assess, treat and discharge or admit or transfer patients yeah. within four hours. Even at the height of these winter pressures, almost eight out of 10 patients being dealt with within Absolutely. that target. And of course, in Scotland, unlike the situation south of the border, we have not sanctioned or had to sanction a blanket deferral of planned operations. Now, Richard Leonard no doubt wants to say that all of uh, what our NHS is facing right now is entirely down to uh, bad planning by the Scottish Government. Well, here's another uh, view. It's a view expressed yesterday in the Welsh Assembly by Labour's Health Secretary in Wales. What, what he said... What he said... It's simply just to make sure we're being consistent in how we approach these things. What he said is that the unprecedented spikes in demand that we've seen in recent weeks are not pressures you can reasonably plan for. Well, do you know what? I actually disagree with that. I think you can uh, plan, and because we have properly planned, we are in a position where, yes, there are pressures on our health service, but we are the best performing health service anywhere in the UK, and those who are delivering that deserve our thanks. Richard Leonard. 
Well, there we are. Presiding officer, the BMA has already said that it's fed up with this government's spin. And patients in Scotland are fed up with it too. And let me give you a real example from right here in Scotland over the last couple of weeks. 80-year-old Tom Wilson of Newton Grange. He fell on New Year's Day and lay bleeding for three hours and a quarter waiting for an ambulance. His son called 999 seven times, only to be told that an ambulance was coming, not from the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, which was just 14 minutes away, but from Kelso. Mr. Wilson then spent 13 hours on a trolley in a corridor in A&E before being admitted to a general ward. That's an 80-year-old man with underlying health conditions waiting more than 16 hours for treatment. And then after four days, he was discharged, despite a nurse telling him he should be kept in hospital, but they needed the bed. So what does the First Minister say to Mr Wilson? First Minister. Well, what I say to Mr Wilson is very simple. I say sorry uh, to Mr Wilson if that was his experience of the health service. I said earlier this week, the health secretary said in the chamber, that we apologise unreservedly, not just at winter, but at any time of the year, to any patient who waits longer than they should do for hospital exactly. treatment um, or doesn't get the standard of treatment that they have a right to expect. And I do that again unequivocally today. I'm more than happy, uh, and the health secretary will be more than happy to look into the specifics of Mr Wilson's case if Richard Leonard wants to pass them uh, to us. Uh, I, I'm not standing here uh, saying, and we have not said at any stage, uh, that some patients are not waiting longer during these uh, winter times than we would want them to wait. That is down to the fact that we are facing uh, demand and increases in demand that are unprecedented. I won't repeat the figures, but anybody can see that when health services and uh, you know, it's, it's the point the Welsh Labour Health Secretary was making yesterday. These are unprecedented spikes in demand uh, and you cannot eliminate the impact on services of that. But because of the winter plans we've put in place, because of the resources, because uh, principally of the hard work of frontline NHS staff, uh, we have a system that is coping admirably uh, and I've given the statistics in terms of accident and emergency uh, and the wider situation in terms of planned operations but that does not take away from the fact uh, that we regret and apologise for anybody who does not get the standard of care that we would want them to get. Richard Leonard. Um, I'm sure you will say that it's got nothing to do with you or the SNP and blame Westminster. I've, I've I've seen, I've seen, I've seen on the news. Order. I've seen on the news. Your answer is we are doing better than England. Is this a joke? These are not my words. They are the words of Mr. Wilson's son in a letter sent this week to the health secretary. Absolutely. So, first minister, you've been found out by the people of Scotland. The doctors, the nurses. The ambulance crews, the patients and their families want to know what you are going to do to fix this mess, this mess that you have created in our NHS. First Minister. Well, firstly, nobody listening to the answer I gave Richard Leonard uh, about the situation of, of Mr Wilson would have concluded that I did anything other than take Absolutely. responsibility on the part of the Scottish exactly. Government. Uh, for that. Interestingly, uh, anybody who was listening to Jeremy Corbyn at Prime Minister's questions yesterday when he was asked about the Welsh uh, Health Service, his answer was it was all the fault of Westminster cuts to the Welsh uh, budget. Uh, something, the, the cuts to the Scottish budget by Westminster, of course, are never recognised uh, by the Labour Party here. But in terms of the health service, I take absolute responsibility for our health service. But that's also why I can point out that we have the best performing health service in the UK. And I know the opposition don't like the comparisons and I make those comparisons not because my ambition is just to be a bit better than England or Wales but when you have opposition politicians who as Richard Leonard has just done say that the pressures in our health service are just down to SNP management then it is entirely legitimate to look at the parts of the UK where their parties are in power and I am not saying that our health service is perfect I when I was health secretary I would never have said that I would not say that 
now. But we have a health service that is performing better than any other part of the UK, and that is because of the record of investment, it's because of the record numbers of staff, it is because of the planning that our health boards are doing, particularly during this winter period. And we will continue to support them to do that so that they can continue to deliver for patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a couple of constituency supplementaries. The first from Gordon Lindhurst. The First Minister may be aware that a recent Freedom of Information request has shown that public counters at some of Edinburgh's police stations are shut or operate restricted hours more than they are open at the advertised times. My understanding, for example, is that Leith Police Station is supposed to operate from 7 a.m. until midnight seven days a week, but was open as advertised on only 29 days between January and 22nd September last year. Now, I'm sure the First Minister would not wish to be dismissive of Leather's concerns about this, so can she explain whether this is an attempt to reduce the police estate by the back door in the face of public opposition, and what reassurances can be given to those who still want face-to-face -face policing but find the local station closed when they need it. First Minister. Uh, I, uh, of course, would uh, never dismiss the concerns of Leithers about uh, police station opening hours or any other matter. Uh, but I have to say, I, I've spent most of this week listening to opposition uh, politicians criticising the Scottish Government for supposedly interfering in the operational decisions uh, of Police Scotland. But here we are today with uh, an opposition member standing up calling, presumably, on me and the Scottish Government to interfere in operational decisions uh, that the police are taking about opening hours uh, of police stations are does appear to me, presiding officer, to be something of an inconsistency uh, in that <laughs> approach. But we'll leave that to one side. On the particular issue of the opening hours, I don't have the particular information uh, that has been cited to me in front of me just now, but I will uh, very happily look into that and I will uh, either personally or ask the Justice Secretary to respond in writing uh, to the points that Gordon Lindhurst has made. Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, it's hard enough after the festive season to return to work and study, but for bus users in Glasgow, this has been accompanied by a very unfestive hike in bus fares by First Bus Glasgow. Does the First Minister agree with me that these rises, including a 40% rise for under-16s and a 10% increase for the unemployed, are simply unacceptable? What plans does she or her minister have to discuss with First Bus the need to reverse these increases? And will she now agree that there is a need for action to re-regulate buses, as called for by unions, community transport groups and the Scottish Cooperative Party, amongst others, to ensure that people get a better service, not unaffordable fare increases? First Minister. Of course, uh, in terms of... Uh, regulation and uh, legislation. Uh, the Programme for Government did uh, announce plans for uh, legislation in uh, this session of Parliament uh, to look at uh, better partnership working and improvement of bus services. In relation to the specific issue that Joanne Lamont raises, I obviously am uh, an MSP for uh, part of the City of Glasgow. I share the concerns uh, that have been expressed by uh, my constituents and many across uh, Scotland about increases in uh, bus fares and the first bus increase that was announced uh, this week. Uh, we will certainly continue to discuss these matters on an ongoing basis uh, with uh, bus companies. Uh, we will do that as a government. I will make representations as a local MSP uh, on the part uh, of my constituents. So of course, individual bus operators have to uh, reach their own decisions. The Scottish Government provides funding to support bus services across Scotland and to help keep fares at affordable levels, and we will continue to take action to do so. So, Bob Doris. First Minister, tomorrow May the Hill Job Centre in my constituency will close its doors for the final time after being asked by the UK Government. This will have a damaging impact on many vulnerable families and communities I represent, not least of all due to longer journey times to job centres and costly rising bus fares, as we've just heard. The UK approach is both deeply flawed and counterproductive. Does the First Minister agree with me eh, that the service should support those, that the job centres should support those to get back into work at the heart of our communities, such as Maryhill, not rip them out of our communities? And will she pledge to do things differently should the power over such matters be given to this Parliament? First Minister. 
Uh, well, I agree very much with Bob Doris. I uh, do not support uh, the plans to close uh, job centres in Glasgow. Again, I, I say that as somebody who represents part of the city of Glasgow and know the importance of having these services uh, accessible uh, to people. In fact, uh, earlier this week, a, a cross-party letter went to the new Secretary of State for uh, work and pensions, uh, asking for reconsideration <coughs> of this. Uh, as we try to help people back into work, particularly those who have been some distance from the labour market, it's important that these services are available without people having to travel inordinate distances uh, in order to access them. Um, we in the Scottish Government, as well as uh, opposing measures like this, we continue to do what we can to mitigate welfare cuts. Um, but I, as I've said before, and I would say again, the sooner we have comprehensive welfare powers uh, in the hands of this Parliament, uh, the better, because that means we can take decisions that are in the interest of the country and decisions that are properly joined up in the interest of the people we serve. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. It's welcome to see both governments attempting to respond to the growing concern about plastic pollution. Uh, the UK might be accused of kicking the issue into the long grass by talking about what it might achieve by 2042. Uh, the Scottish Government wants to highlight the issue of cotton buds, which, to be fair, is a much easier area where change is already happening and alternative products are already in the shops. The issue is far more challenging than that and urgent, uh, given that China is understandably unwilling to keep taking ever more of the West's plastic waste. And people will not and should not accept simply building more incinerators around the country. Does the First Minister accept that by framing this issue, talking about it merely as litter, plastic litter, there is a risk that we're implying that it's all about consumer behaviour instead of placing responsibility firmly where it belongs with the highly profitable businesses and industries which are the real source of the problem. First Minister. Um, yes, I do agree with that, although I would say it has to be both. Um, I do think there is a, an obligation on and a real responsibility on the part of companies uh, to get their own houses in order. In that respect, I would absolutely agree with Patrick Harvey. Uh, we also have to uh, encourage consumers to look at changing their own behaviour, and uh, I uh, would certainly uh, back uh, efforts to do that. But governments also have to look at the levers we have, whether that's levies on uh, single-use plastic products uh, or other uh, actions to reduce uh, the use of disposable plastic. I think the Scottish Government's got a very good uh, record here through the action we've already taken on plastic uh, bag levy, for example. Uh, we've already announced our intention, which I know was welcomed by Patrick Harvey and the Greens, to introduce a, a deposit return scheme for uh, drinks containers. Uh, we have announced our intention to set up an expert group to look at other levies uh, and actions that could be taken uh, around other products, plastic straws, for example. And in that respect, let me pay tribute to Kate Forbes, who I know has a question later in FMQs uh, for the campaign she has uh, launched around uh, straws. And of course, as Patrick Harvey says, the Environment Secretary uh, today has announced our intention to ban uh, plastic stem uh, cotton buds. So we're taking a range of action and I do think that's the right approach. And it's not about letting uh, any uh, particular interest off the hook. It's about companies, it's about consumers, and it's about governments. Where I, and my final point, and I absolutely agree with Patrick Harvey, is that this is urgent, and I think it's more urgent than the 25-year timescale that the Prime Minister has set out today. Patrick Harvey. Plastic pollution is, of course, utterly connected to our society's economic addiction to oil and gas. Fossil fuels and industrial chemicals are two sides of the same coin and this week we learned that one oil industry voice wants to see decommissioned rigs simply dumped in the sea, millions of tonnes of industrial waste while cotton buds make the headlines and another fossil fuel company wants to take the government to court for protecting Scotland from fracking. Both the UK and Scottish governments like to claim credit for environmental action but they also want ever bigger tax breaks for the very fossil fuel companies that are at the root of our environmental crisis. Isn't it time to recognise that we can no longer invest our future in the fossil fuel industry and we should be joining instead the hundreds of cities, institutions and countries that are truly leading, like New York, which this week confirmed that it's taking the fight to the fossil fuel industry with legal action and a programme of divestment. Will the First Minister accept that it's time to embrace a positive fossil fuel free future 
for Scotland. First Minister. Well, firstly, we support appropriately our oil and gas sector because it is important to our economy. There's lots of jobs dependent on it. But I really don't think, whatever, whether, whether you agree or disagree with that, I, I genuinely don't think it is fair to criticise uh, the Scottish Government for lack of action in terms of support for renewable uh, energy. Uh, if anything, we are a world leader in terms of the transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And we set out in the programme for government, for example, on our ambition around uh, electric and low emission vehicles, even uh, greater action in, in the longer term. Um, as uh, Patrick Harvey has alluded to, we've taken the decision not to allow fracking uh, in Scotland, and I, I won't say too much uh, more about that given uh, the announcement around a judicial review this week, but we are confident in the decision we've taken there and in the process behind that decision. So we will continue to lead by example. This is one of these issues that is important, uh, not just for uh, this generation, but for generations to come. And all of us have a responsibility to do the right thing, and this government will continue to make sure that we do it. Question number four, Willie Rennie. <clears throat> I've listened uh, very carefully to what the First Minister has been saying, but the pressure faced by the NHS has been coming for years. It was largely predictable. The long waits at accident emergency units are in part because of failures elsewhere in the NHS. Failures in three fundamentals, in mental health, in social care and in primary care. Failures for which she is responsible. She was Health Secretary after all. So why is it that staff and patients like Mr Wilson, who have to suffer today because of Nicola Sturgeon's failure to do her job over the last 10 years? First Minister. For a representative of the Liberal Democrats, the co-architects of austerity in this country, to stand up and ask that question is frankly unbelievable and quite staggering hypocrisy. Uh, we have, through the actions we've taken in the face of that austerity, uh, ensured record investment in our National Health Service, including transferring more and more investment into social care, into uh, primary care. We've got plans for that over this parliament and mental health. This year, for the first time, the mental health uh, budget will top a billion uh, pounds in Scotland. We've got record numbers of staff in our National Health Service. Uh, during a winter period where, despite what Willie Rennie says, the pressures on our health service are unprecedented. Flu le levels right now four times what they were this time last year. Uh, it is not possible to eliminate the impact on the service of that kind of increase in pressure. Uh, but because of the actions we have taken in the face of the austerity imposed partly by his party, as I've said repeatedly in this chamber uh, this afternoon, we have the best performing health service in the UK, and that is something we should be proud of. Really, really. First Minister, the First Minister does really have got a brass neck. If these plans, if these plans that she has just set out are the obvious answer, then why didn't she deliver them when she was Health Secretary? She's hide, she can hide behind these plans. She can't hide behind the NHS in England or even in Wales. And she can't hide behind just blandly thanking NHS staff over and over again. We're 800 GPs short. That's her responsibility. 3,000 Scots are waiting for mental health treatment. That's her responsibility. And today, 1,000 people are stuck in hospital because of the lack of home care. That is her responsibility. We are all proud of our NHS staff enduring the conditions created by Nicola Sturgeon. But tell me, is she really proud of what she has done to our NHS? First Minister. The health service budget up under this government to record levels. The number of people working in our health service up under this government to record levels. Delayed discharge uh, down over the past year. This health service in Scotland, despite the winter pressures, which I readily acknowledge the pressure that puts not just on patients but on staff, the health service in Scotland is and I'll say it again, the best performing anywhere in the UK. And that is down partly to policy, but that is down principally to the hard work of those right across our health service. And they, uh, I think, deserve better and more gratitude, not just from this government, but from parties right across this yeah. chamber. Yeah. 
And we have a few more uh, supplementaries. The first from Christine Graham. Oh, uh, thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. <laughs> thank you, Presiding Officer. I've given up. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of the recent BBC Scotland documentary exposing deficiencies in the efficacy of bankruptcy proceedings, focusing, for example, on bankruptcy cheats such as Morris Scott, the bankrupt behind Loch Leven 2 Limited, which actually has planning applications for nine properties in Gala Shields in my constituency. Will the First Minister, given that Morris Scott left debts of 42 million, cocking a snook at all of us, and in particular his creditors and the trustee in bankruptcy, will the First Minister review the bankruptcy process, including an increase in inspection and monitoring of declaration of assets pre-bankruptcy and post-bankruptcy, the operation of bankruptcy restriction orders. First Minister. Well, I thank Christine Graham for raising this issue. I, like many people, would have been concerned by some of the revelations in the recent BBC documentary. I can uh, give an assurance that in light of that, of course, this government will look at uh, aspects of bankruptcy uh, legislation and regulation to see whether there are changes uh, we require to make. Christine Graham has asked uh, some very specific questions there about particular aspects of uh, the bankruptcy regime and I will make sure the relevant minister in due course responds to her in detail once we've had the opportunity to review these aspects. Neil Finlay. Uh, this month the children's ward at St John's Hospital will have been closed to inpatients out of hours for over 200 days. When will it reopen as a 24-7 service? First Minister. It will reopen as soon as uh, possible. It is, of course, a, a matter of regret that uh, the situation has arisen. Uh, the situation is to ensure safety for uh, patients, and that is important, vitally important for all patients, but I think all of us would accept uh, particularly important for children. So as soon as the recruitment challenges have been uh, addressed there and there are efforts underway right now to recruit uh, into that ward, uh, the ward will reopen. Of course, uh, Neil Finlay uh, previously used to say that our plan was to close this ward uh, permanently. That was not the case. Uh, we are determined to make sure that this uh, ward remains open to serve uh, patients in West Lothian uh, and look forward to it being open uh, properly as soon as possible. Mary Gujam. The Finance and Constitution Committee of this Parliament unanimously agreed that the EU withdrawal bill in its current state is incompatible with the devolution settlement. Now, the UK government has failed to deliver on its promises to bring forward key amendments to the bill at report stage, which is deeply regrettable and it's a disgrace. And it leaves Scotland's fate in the hands of the unelected and undemocratic House of Lords. Does the First Minister agree that now is the time for everyone in this chamber to unite in a simple message? Hands off Scotland's Parliament. First Minister. Well, uh, the, the failure to bring forward amendments to the withdrawal bill uh, at the report stage of, of the House of Commons is not just a disgrace, although it absolutely is a disgrace. It's, uh, in direct contradiction to the promise that the Secretary of State for Scotland made that these amendments would be brought forward to the House of Commons and not to the undemocratic, unelected House of Lords. That promise has been completely uh, broken. And there is no excuse. I heard uh, Tory MPs during the week saying, oh, it was you know, unfortunate, it was due, due to the tight timescale. The Scottish Government and the Welsh Government jointly wrote the amendments uh, that could have been lodged uh, or supported by the UK Government. So uh, we need to see amendments uh, without further uh, delay. Uh, but not only any amendments, we need to see amendments amendments that properly address the issue. Uh, clause 11 of that bill is a power grab. That's uh, the view of the cross-party committee of this parliament. And uh, we will not recommend to this parliament approval of that bill unless clause 11 and the other aspects that concern uh, people across the chamber are properly addressed. Uh, we hope we can still find agreement and we will continue to work constructively in order to try to find agreement. But of course, we have to prepare for that not being possible. And that's why, of course, we have set out uh, plans to bring forward, if necessary, our own continuity bill. But it is absolutely disgraceful that having uh, launched this power grab on this parliament, uh, the Tories have then broken all of the promises they've made so far about fixing it. So let's see that change sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah. Question number five, Kate Forbes. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government plans to reduce the use of single-use disposable plastics, such as plastic straws. First Minister. Well, we are uh, determined to tackle the blight uh, of plastic 
uh, that does so much damage to our environment generally and to our oceans and beaches in particular. Uh, as I've already uh, said in response to earlier questions, we've already outlined our intention to introduce a deposit return scheme. And of course, today the Environment Secretary has set out proposals to ban plastic straw stemmed uh, cotton buds. Uh, also, as we committed to in our programme for government, we will appoint an expert panel to provide advice on further charges and other actions we might take to reduce Scotland's use of single-use uh, items such as plastic straws. And let me again commend Kate Forbes for the campaign that she has launched. Kate Forbes. Thank you. Um, as the First Minister has already referenced, the UK government's uh, environmental plan in, published this morning says it will take 25 years to tackle avoidable plastic waste, including plastic straws. So if Sunnyside and Ullapool primary school pupils can eliminate plastic straws in an entire village in a matter of months with their nay straw at all campaign, does the First Minister agree that the UK government's target of 25 years lacks a bit of urgency, whilst plastic straws will continue to pollute our seas? First Minister. Well, firstly, let me uh, commend and congratulate uh, the pupils of Sunnyside Primary School. I think they set uh, an example to all of us. Um, I do uh, take the view, and I, I said this to Patrick Harvey, that we don't have the luxury of 24 years, and uh, neither do our coastal communities like Ullapool, uh, who are already taking local action. Uh, Blue Planet may have woken up the UK government to the issue of plastics in our seas, but we have been alive to this issue for some time and have been leading the way in taking action. As I've already said, uh, in the programme for government, we set out plans to develop a deposit return scheme. We've already introduced a more comprehensive carrier bag charge and we set out in our circular economy strategy how we can benefit economically uh, from looking after the environment. And uh, as I've said uh, on a couple of occasions now, we've announced today uh, plans around uh, plastic cotton buds. So we will always look to work constructively with other governments in the UK and beyond. But I think it's clearer than ever that decisions about our precious natural environment are best made here in Scotland because we are leading the way. Maurice Colden. I do, officer, and I declare interest with respect to my work at Zero Waste Scotland. Um, I welcome the plans from the UK government and the Scottish uh, government around problem plastics. However, last year the SNP revealed that over the next five years they are forecasting a 12-fold increase in incineration capacity in Scotland. And I'm sure the First Minister will, will agree it's better to recycle valuable products such as plastics rather than burn them. Therefore, will the First Minister consider the introduction of a moratorium on any new incineration facilities in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I'll ask Paul Wheelhouse, who's actually the uh, relevant minister here, to, to respond to the issue uh, about incineration. But can I actually you know, agree uh, with the points the member has made? It's much better to recycle plastic. In fact, I would go further than that. It's much better to try to avoid the, the use uh, of plastics where uh, we possibly can. And that's very much the focus of our actions. But where uh, plastics are used, then recycling should be our priority. That's very much at the heart of our circular economy uh, strategy um, and some of the measures that I've already outlined today. So, you know, hopefully uh, we can, uh, if not on every particular aspect of this, uh, on some of the key aspects of this, actually have quite a lot of consensus across the chamber about the actions we need to take. Question six, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. May I draw members to my register of interest and remind members that I own a small business to ask the first minister what action the Scottish government is taking to improve small business confidence in light of reports suggesting that it is at a near record low. First Minister. Well, we're maintaining the expanded small business bonus scheme, removing the rates burden for 100,000 premises. And as announced in the draft budget, we will continue to fund the most competitive business rates relief package anywhere in the UK. We're also delivering a record uh, £2.4 billion investment in enterprise and skills uh, and will invest £600 million in expanding uh, broadband to 100% of premises across the country. And of course, we are also on course to deliver the new Th South of Scotland Enterprise Agency as part of our plan to drive forward economic growth while supporting communities and resources in the area. Rachel Hamilton for that answer. Before my supplementary question, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome pupils from Kelso High School to the Chamber today. Presiding Officer, the Federation of Small Business, Scottish Policy Convener Andy Willocks said their recent findings show a long-term optimism gap between a typical firm in Scotland and their counterparts elsewhere in the UK. 
If Scotland is to confound predictions of sluggish economic growth for the foreseeable future, then closing this gap should be a top priority. Will the First Minister listen to the concerns of small business and will she reverse the government's tax plans to help small business confidence grow? First Minister. Sorry, I thought we weren't allowed to make comparisons between Scotland and, and England. I, I thought that wasn't... So let me get this right. Let me get this right, OK? Just, just for clarity, presiding officer. Where Scotland is doing better than the rest of the UK, the Tories' position is we're not allowed to say that because comparisons are not legitimate. But where uh, they say Scotland is not doing as well as the rest of the UK, it's absolutely fine to make those comparisons. Is that really the rules that the Tories want to play by? Let me make two points on small businesses. Uh, firstly, as I've said, uh, we are investing significant sums of money in supporting our small businesses. We do recognise uh, the concerns that our small businesses uh, have about uh, the economy generally, not just in Scotland, but across uh, the whole UK, which is why supporting uh, the continuation of the small business bonus is uh, the, the most important thing in terms uh, of the, the Small Business Federation. Uh, but secondly, if you speak to most businesses, small, medium or large right now, uh, the top reason for the anxiety and the concerns that they will express yeah. are Brexit. Yeah. That is why so many businesses are so concerned about the future. Yeah. And we've seen again this week the ineptitude at the heart of this Tory government as they take this country closer and closer to the Brexit cliff edge. And that's why every time a Tory stands up in this chamber to talk about these kinds of issues, they should be deeply embarrassed yeah. of what their party at Westminster yeah. is preparing to do to the interests of this country. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what her view is regarding recent comments by the Tory party, particularly Murdo Fraser MSP's criticism of her government aid to small businesses. Does she agree with me that this is another example of Tory double standards. First Minister. Well, I, I tend not to take anything that Myrtle Fraser says particularly seriously. Maybe that's just, maybe that's just me, but uh, I, I've come to uh, realise recently that not much he says uh, is particularly serious. But the double standards at the heart of the Tory uh, party today I think have been on blatant display for everybody, calling for more money for a National Health Service while proposing tax policies that would rip £500 million pounds out of Scotland's budget on top of the cuts that the Westminster government is already making, telling us we can't compare Scotland's performance to the rest of the UK when we're doing better, but been quite happy to do it on other occasions. And of course, uh, getting up in this chamber and talking about the concerns of our business community while their party is imposing Brexit on Scotland, which is going to do untold damage to our businesses and to our economy generally. Every single one of these Tories on all of these issues and on so many more, frankly, should be ashamed of themselves. Thank you, and that concludes First Minister's questions. We now move to Members' Business in the name of Tom Arthur on the Carer Positive Employer <coughs> Initiative. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.